so good to see all of you this morning. And as we pray for, for Elmer Nolt, uh, we hold him to the Lord in prayer and pray for healing for him. And we also then think about Fred Reeser, and we are really seeing a miracle take place. And I just invite you to continue to pray for Fred. You know, a week ago at this time, we really did not think he was going to make it through the night. And the doctors continued to be just astounded by his, his progress. And let me just read to you what Marie Hoover sent to me this morning. And she said this, Fred just called me. He remembered our phone number and called by himself. The doctor came in while we were talking and said, I was pretty worried about him a couple days ago, but this is a miracle turnaround. He said Fred will likely be discharged in two or three days. Praise God. Do you want to... So that just, uh, I, I think we sometimes only really realize how important various people are, and we're, it's all of us, when we think about the prospect of losing someone. And I, I found myself with Fred saying, not yet, not yet. I know we're all mortal. It comes a time for all of us. You just find yourself saying, we're not ready to give him up yet. And uh, we just keep praying for, for a miracle. And his situation is tenuous because an infection could set him back pretty quickly, but we just pray protection against complications. If you want to put the first slide up there, Chris, the psalm, there we go. <clears throat> I just really felt a sense of leading to this series on the psalms, particularly this, this aspect of when you don't know how to pray. The Psalms give us words when we don't have words. There's a scripture that says, we do not know, this is in the New Testament, we do not know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And that's referring to just a lot of different ways where the, the gift of, of a prayer language and the gift of tongues, but it's also, there's times where maybe you're praying and you feel like your prayer is inarticulate and, and ramblings, but if the Spirit of God is in that, that prayer, when you don't know how to pray, may be more powerful and more effective and more pleasing to God than the most articulate, well-written invocation given by a clergy person. <laughs> that the, the, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective and, and the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness and helps us to pray. And the Psalms are this, this incredible gift to, from God to us. I think it's the Psalms are not intended just to be occasionally read and prayed. They are intended for us to be praying in a regular kind of way. It is the school of prayer from which we never graduate, that we continue to, to need the Psalms and rely on the Psalms. And, and the Psalms particularly, most of the Psalms speak from the perspective of those moments in life where you're on the ragged edge where you are at the end of yourself, where you, life has been disoriented, where life doesn't make sense, where it's chaotic and scary and uncertain and even makes you angry. That's the place where most of the Psalms come from. They come from that place. Um, Bonhoeffer, in the last 10 years of his life, lived this, this intensely difficult time and just went to the Psalms with just an eagerness to pray prayers when he didn't have words. And Psalm 30 became, Psalm 30 became particularly important to him as he was in prison. And he prayed his anger, Psalm 30, his anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And that was a prayer that got him through. And he, he ended up uh, dying a martyr's death, but, uh, but the Psalms were a great comfort to him. You know, I, I still remember a, a conversation. I, I have these conversations from my life that just stand out for some odd reason. Um, but I remember at, being a senior at Lancashire Mennonite High School, and whenever we'd get to school, friends would stand around and talk. And, and this one morning, my one friend, driving to school, stopped for to fill up with his tank for gas, took about 15 minutes, got back in his car, coming to school, came to an intersection and had a fender bender and totaled his car. And that's, that's just devastating. That's just hard for anybody of any age. 
And, and I remember him, him speaking, talking to us at school and saying, if I just would have not stopped for gas 15 minutes later, then I wouldn't have had to hit that car at the gas sta- at the intersection and, and just beating himself up for this. And I, m- I remember another friend of mine saying, you know, that's exactly how, how I felt when I had my car accident. I kept thinking back if I'd have just eaten an extra waffle or if I'd have just brushed my teeth, all that would have set the timing off and I wouldn't have had that accident. And, and just listening to my one friend just bring comfort to the other friend and said, you got to quit that. you got to let it go and just, and just trust God. But those are the places, those, those, uh, those times where life doesn't make sense, those are the times the psalms become particularly words for our prayers. There are some psalms that speak from that place of life is good. That one psalm that says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. It's a beautiful psalm. And, and we love those times in life when that is our testimony. And when that's how it feels, declare that to God. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. We give thanks for that. We talked last week about being thankful to God and how important that is. But it's also important to be able to express the hard stuff to God. Laments, anger, confusion, frustration. You know, there's some very difficult things going on in the world right now. And it's easy for us to get caught up in the, the situation here in our country. But in Ethiopia, they are on the verge of a civil war. And having just been there a year ago and having friends in Ethiopia and the Meseretti Christos Church, I, my heart breaks for these church leaders because it's a tribal kind of conflict. And right now, the, the, the event that's causing a lot of tension is the election has been delayed because of COVID. And there's tribes c- accusing one another. There's just a lot of turmoil. And this thing is about to blow up. And I think about my friends who are in leadership in the Meseretti Christos Church who are trying to pastor people of different tribes and how these tribes in the secular world are are turning against one another and these folks are represented in the church. This is a time when you cry out to the Lord, Oh Lord, help me, for I am weak. And so I I pray for, I I think it's a time when, when these folks are crying out to the Lord and the Psalms are a place that gives voice to our prayers. O oh Lord, Psalm 10 says, why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? O oh Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You listen to them when they cry. You know, the, 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 pray, the prayers in the Psalms, they often begin with this brutal kind of raw kind of honesty to God, saying, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Says Psalm 13. Psalm 38, O Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger. Your arrows have pierced me. Your hand has come down upon me. Just this raw kind of honesty before God. But you will see time and time again that the psalm begins with this rawness, this anger, this confusion, and that prayer of the psalmist. By the end of the psalm, most always that, that prayer is transformed to one of thanksgiving. But you, O God, are good and loving you do see me. There's this consolation. There's the prayer of the one praying it. The prayer is transformed and changed. Yes, our prayers are powerful and effective and change things. But what sometimes we need more than anything else is to pray and be changed as we pray. And the psalmist models that again and again and again. <clears throat> we are invited to a life with God. You're invited to have a life with God. Conrad Kanegi recently was challenging some of us as, as pastors in our conference, and he said, do you have a life with God? How many of us who have, you know, we are working hard in the church, or we've been attending church, or, or we have a religious practice in our lives, but don't really have a life with God? And Conrad was challenging us and saying, you are invited to the privilege and the blessing of a life with God in which you are in communication, you know, in a relationship with the living God. And as wonderful as the New Testament is in sharing Jesus with us, The Psalms are really where we see what it looks like to have an intimate, honest, real, transforming relationship with the Almighty, the creator of the universe, who you can complain to, who you can lament to, who you can give thanks to, 
who hears the honesty of our hearts and empathizes and heals us and transforms us. I want to share a story that helps me understand this. You know, years ago, in, uh, when I was in 23, 24, <clears throat> Jennifer and I started dating. And um, you know how, if, if those of you who remember those days when you were dating, there's a, a in, in a dating relationship, you can put forth the best side of yourself. <clears throat> you can put your best foot forward for a little while. And you can keep those aspects of yourself that uh, your own brokenness, your own dysfunction that we all have because we're human, you can, you can keep that hidden away for quite a long time. And as Jennifer and I began getting more serious in our relationship, I remember this moment of, of somewhat of a fear because I realized good and well that if we were to take our relationship to another level and, and enter into marriage, With all the wonderful things that come with marriage, I knew good and well that there were parts of me that I couldn't hide anymore, that inevitably there would be times where I would hurt Jennifer, cause her pain, and there was a part of me that just didn't want to experience that messy, painful side of myself. That dating was great because you can, you know, you come and go and you can, we all know how that is, you know, if you, that you can put yourself out there. But in marriage, there's no hiding. And I remember sharing that at one point with Jennifer and saying, here's my fear. And I remember Jennifer's response being, yeah, but there's forgiveness and there's reconciliation. And that would be part of the picture too, would it not? Said, yes, it would. And as anyone knows who gets married, as wonderful as marriage is, marriage is yes, there are those, there's no hiding. And we, we, we find out our true selves. Uh, Andres has said at different times, he said, I just thought I was this wonderful, wonderful person. Then I got married. <laughs> He's real honest about that. And you come face to face with those sides of yourself that you don't like. And I love that we can be honest with that. I, but I, boy, I, it was one of the best decisions I ever made to get married. Best decision was to give my life to Jesus. Second best was to, to, be, to marry Jennifer in the midst of the realities of, of how difficult that can be at times for any of us in marriage. But I bring that to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, in a, in a human and human relationship, you have two broken people who are finding their way by the grace of God through forgiveness and reconciliation together. But you are invited into this real life relationship with the Almighty in which you are the broken one and God is the embodiment of wholeness, shalom, perfection, all-knowing wisdom, and you are invited into a relationship with the living God. And the Psalms show us what that looks like. And sometimes it's the messiness of our own lives that we just lay before God and God just bring it to me. Because I love you. And as you share that with me, the laments, the frustrations, you don't have to clean it up before you bring it to God. It's the bringing it to God that transforms us. That's what that relationship with God is like. Conrad Carnegie went on to say to those of us different times, he said four years ago he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the young age of 56, 57, something like that. And that, as you can imagine, was just a very difficult diagnosis of process to think about. And Conrad would share, he said, you know, he, he always knew he was mortal and was going to die someday, but it, it put before him the reality that he knew he was in the last chapter of his life. Hopefully a long chapter. He's still continuing to teach. He's continuing to pastor at Etown Mennonite Church. He's still working with the conference. But he knew that there's an end somewhere, and it's, it's, he's closer to the end than certainly he is to the beginning of life. And he, he found himself, the Lord saying to him, if you're ever going to experience real life, have a life with me, it's now or never. You've got to do it now. And so Conrad entered into a depth of relationship with God in these last four years, unlike any he's ever experienced before. And he's sharing out of the richness of that that sometimes it's, it's when you come to that place of desperation, of, of recognize the frailty of yourself, that brings you to the place of, of 
of relationship with God, of real life with God like none other. And, and, and Conrad's experience recently has just been this, this abundance of overflow, of overflow, fresh courage, of, of sharing out of what it means to have a life with God. I want to just, uh, just to off, offer a few of these psalms here. I'm not sure where I put that. Oh, there we go, Tanner. You want to throw that up here? All right, let's get, see if this, uh, see if I can, it's been a while since I used this thing. All right, you can advance the slide. <laughs> see if you can make that go, if not. Okay, <clears throat> let's go to the next slide there. My soul finds rest. In God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. And, and we know you don't have to live long in this life to recognize that life is full of many things that bring you unrest. And in so many ways, is it not true that our nation right now is at a place of unrest? Unrest. Ethiopia is a place of unrest. People who are, are ill and sick experience that as unrest. Elmer is a place, it's, it's an unrestful place. Even Fred, an unrestful place. That's in Central America with the hurricanes coming, the danger in Honduras and Costa Rica and Guatemala. These countries, Belize, they are in a place of unrest and uncertainty as the floodwaters rise, as there's devastation, and then in the midst of COVID, unrest. And what the Lord says to us in Psalms is, is that, that my soul, God intends for us to find a place of rest. Parkinson's for, for Conrad Kanegi stirred him up and made him extremely restless. And as we join our voice with the prayer of the Psalms, we say, my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. That is a prayer birthed out of a place of pain and unrest. And God has given us that prayer in the Psalms that says, now pray this. Even before you feel it, pray it. You pray it, and you pray it. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, sometimes people will say to him, I don't understand this Psalm. I don't feel the, what this Psalm is saying. How can I pray it? And, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say, how can you understand it until you pray it? It's when you pray it that, in, that you come to understand it. But if you wait until you understand it or wait until you feel it, you'll never pray it. So you pray it before you actually feel it, and the transformation happens. I have shared with you before about a, some of you will remember this, but for me it's one of the best ways I understand the Psalms and how they teach us to pray. There's a movie called Finding Forrester. And it's a movie about this young man named Jamal who lives in the Bronx, New York. And there's this reclusive writer who has, he, um, he's scared to come out of his apartment. And he's this old man who lives in his apartment in the Bronx, and there's this young man, Jamal. And, and this, this old man named Mr. Uh, Mr. Forrester is this incredible writer, kind of like a Hemingway, who wrote this one incredible novel. And then after he wrote that novel, he never came out of his apartment. He has someone bring him food. He's scared of the world. And somehow, this young man, Jamal, who is this writing prodigy, comes into this friendship with this old writer. And he mentors him as a writer. And one day, the, 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 one of the scenes in the movie is that Jamal is sitting down at the typewriter in Forrester's apartment trying to write. And he can't think of anything to write. He sits there at the keyboard. And he sits there. He can't write. It's writer's block. He, he, he's this brilliant writer, but he can't write in that moment. And Forrester, the old man, goes to his filing cabinet, pulls out one of the pieces of his writing, just this masterful piece of writing, and he says, there, start with my words until you find your own. And so Jamal sits there at the keyboard, and he begins typing the words of the master. And he types, and he types, 
and he types, and he picks up the rhythm of the master's writing until finally he finds his own words and he takes off. And I really believe that that is how the Psalms intend to teach us to pray, that they are the words that God gives us and who says, pray these words until they become your own. And when you pray the Psalms, there's, there's a, when you pray something like this, my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. As you find the Spirit of God giving you your own words to launch into that. That's the way the Psalms are intended to function. We pray those words that God has given us, but then they give birth through the Holy Spirit to the words that express our situation. That, uh, it, it, another image I would, I would give to you is this one. We have a, a sliding patio door, a, a sliding screen door on our back of our house. And it, it slides along on a track. But inevitably, we have, it happens all the time to us, someone will bump that screen door and it comes off the track. And, and then you ha- you, the door doesn't work, it's not on the track. And you have to make a special effort to put that screen door back in that track so it slides again smoothly. And I really think that, for me, that's a... An image of sometimes our, my own attitudes can become so bad or so ungodly. I can become so, you know, enter into complaining or just not being thankful. And, and even then my prayers are not expressing the heart of God. And I believe what the Psalms can do when you get to those moments where you're frustrated and you go to the Psalms and you see, ah, the psalmist was frustrated at times too and offer those prayers to God. And, and I believe what the Psalms do is they have this, this impact of getting us back on track, just like my screen door. But all of us, it happens all the time that we need to, to come back. It's a little bit like this. If you're cutting pieces of wood, and they each need to be six inches long, and you have a pattern, and you cut the first one, and then you cut the second one, you'd, I'm getting a little over my head here, but you don't cut off the new piece. You go back to the original, right, Henry? Because if you cut off the new piece, each one will be a sixteenth of, sixteenth of an inch bigger, sixteenth of an inch bigger until you're way off. But you go back to the original pattern that the Spirit of God has given us, and it's the Psalms are, are, are that original piece of the Spirit of God showing us how to pray. When you don't know how to pray, when you forget how to pray, when you don't feel like praying, the Psalms become that original pattern of the Spirit of God giving us words to enliven our prayers, to, to jumpstart our prayer life when you don't know how to pray. I, uh, the Spirit of God is, is so faithful. And I, one of the Psalms here, I just want to show Psalm 51. Psalm 51, a very familiar Psalm to so many of you, so many of us. It's, it's written from the perspective of when David had really, really, really messed up where David, this man who is, a, who is said to be a man after God's own heart, had committed adultery, and then he had actually connived and had the husband of this woman killed to cover up his sin. And on top of that, David didn't feel any guilt about it. He had developed a calloused heart. You could say the screen door of David's heart had come so off the track and he didn't even know it. That when the prophet Nathan confronted him about it, even told him this story that, couldn't, that was so obvious he was talking about David's sin, David didn't even recognize it. He was so hardened in his heart. And the prophet Nathan said to David, that man is you, David. And when the weight of that recognition came over David, he was filled with sorrow when he saw the sin that had been revealed to him. And this is the prayer that God gave David to pray in repentance. What an amazing prayer where it says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will come back to you. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. When you don't know the words for repentance, use these. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit, given to David, who had messed up more than just anyone can really mess up. And that this prayer was received by God in forgiveness. I am... we, have, we moved into our house 15 years ago, 
and it was decorated in full 1980 styles. And over the years, we have been trying to update that house little by little, but the bathroom in particular, we won, um, the, the wallpaper was just vintage, probably 1978. And at one point, we began trying to peel off these layers of wallpaper. And you'd get beyond one layer, and it was 10 years back, and it was pretty bad. And then the next layer was even worse, and the next layer was even worse and back. But what was really hard in our bathroom was that the previous owners had not only, they just painted over the wallpaper and then put new wallpaper on top of that, and then they painted over that, and then put more as nightmare. And so I began, and I'm not the handiest person, as you know, to begin with, but I began trying to scrape wallpaper off. And we use chemicals on that wall and use different kind of things and scrape and scrape. And I damaged that drywall. I kept gouging the drywall, kept trying to smooth it over. And finally, I came to the place where I realized I can't do this on my own. This is too much. And so we hired Leon Hurst, the drywaller, to come in. And he came in as the master, and, uh, and he took over. And there were different places that drywall needed to be replaced altogether. Some places just needed to have another coat of plaster on it and sand it. And he took that, uh, that room that I had damaged, and he made it the walls white as snow <laughs> and smooth and sanded them. And I, I just offer this to you. I just think when we talk about having a life with God, that one of the ways that we can fall into is just like that bathroom of mine where we have things in our lives that are difficult. And when we don't bring those things to the Lord, we find dysfunctional ways of acting out on things that are difficult in our lives. And it, it's a little bit like that wallpaper. Instead of peeling it off, you just paint over it and then slap another layer on top. And, and so many of us have lived our lives where we accumulate layers of pain Layers of things we should have lamented to God. Grief that's not been worked through in a proper way. Anger that's not been worked through. Healing that should have happened and never did. And we slap layer after layer after layer and we paint over it. And there comes that place where we even try to do that for other people. Where I say, let me help you, brother, with that sin in your life. And come at it with a, a big scraper and, try, and we do damage to one another. And the Holy Spirit would say to us, I am the great one who forgives. I am the one who cleanses you. I am the one who, who brings hope of forgiveness, redemption. It's through me, Jesus Christ. You will hear, and Bonhoeffer says this, you will hear the voice of Jesus in the Psalms. You will hear Jesus in the Psalms. And Jesus even cried out in the Psalms on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a feeling that was real for Jesus that was expressed in the Psalms. That Jesus was able to express it. The Psalms were in the heart of Jesus. The Psalms expressed the Spirit of God. As we uh, come to a close here, I just want to share one more story. Um, as we think about how hard life can be and how much God intends for us to be in regular conversation with God about what we're experiencing Marcus Smucker, who some of you knew from years ago, he passed away some years back, but one of the things he would say to people when he would talk to them about things in their life was, if they were sharing something that was difficult, he would say, how is it that you are talking to God about that? What do your prayers sound like to God? How are you discussing that with God? It's one of the first things he would ask for a person who was struggling. How are you talking to God about that? That we are to bring all of our troubles to God no matter how difficult they may seem or may, how much we don't understand them. I share this last story. Um, when Jennifer and I got married, we got a wedding gift, and it was this book written by Christmas Carol Kaufman. The book is called Danny of Cedar Cliffs. And the interesting thing was, it was a, a really meaningful wedding gift because Jennifer's relative, Christmas Carol Kaufman, through marriage, wrote this book about my great-great-great-grandparents. So, really interesting connection there, that her relative wrote a book about my relative. And one of the stories in that book uh, is about, it was during the Civil War. And my great-great-great-grandparents, their names were Jake and Elizabeth Martin, and they lived in Washington County, Maryland. And they were Mennonite farmers during the Civil War. And they were young, 21, 20, 21, 
my daughter's almost that age. So I can identify with what it would feel like, how young this is. And they were married, and it was in the midst of the Civil War. And imagine living in Maryland during the Civil War, a Confederate territory, Confederate place. And there you are. You have relatives in the north. You have relatives in the south who are at war with each other, who are killing one another. What do you do? What's going to happen? What is the uncertainty in that time? And there came a time when the Confederates were being defeated and they were desperate and they were starving and they were hungry. And they came, they were crossing in the Potomac River, coming right to the, vil- the town there where my great-great-grandparents, Jake and Elizabeth, lived. And they were coming along and they were taking the men, no matter how old they were, and conscripting them into the military. They were taking their livestock and cattle. They were stealing anything they could because they were desperate and hungry. And my great-great-great-grandfather, Jacob, took the livestock, 13 head of cattle, and he headed north up to York to hide the cattle. And he said to, to Elizabeth, his wife, he said, they're not going to harm the women. You stay here. I can't quite imagine this. And feed them when they come through. Don't be afraid. And remember, there's a God above. And then he took the cattle and he, and he left. And there's Elizabeth, this great, great, great grandmother of mine. And sure enough, they came through. And they demanded of her that she feed them. And so she had this big barrel of flour. And she, for a 12-hour period of time, they demanded more and more. And she made biscuits during a, for 12 hours straight, in and out of this oven, feeding these Confederates biscuits, feeding them, feeding them, feeding them until the flour was completely gone. They took all the chickens. They took everything. But they did not harm her. And they were on their way. This 21-year-old woman... Who, who underwent this trauma and, and stood strong and, and was faithful and God protected her. But I, I turned to, I think, how did, how did these people come through this and not be totally traumatized? How do you come out of that and not experience this incredible post-traumatic stress disorder? How do you not allow that to totally warp your understanding of, of the world and of God. And, and I believe that they turned to the Psalms and read Psalms like Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. You are my hiding place, O God. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. My soul finds rest in you alone. And and I and I from the way the rest of their lives lived out, they went on to live lives of deep devotion to God. And and were able to pass along a faith from generation to generation to generation. This is my great 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 grandparents. And they were able to allow those experiences by praying, crying out to the Lord for help. And allowing God to enter into their experience and transform their grief and terror into a deep abiding trust in God that has been passed on a generation to generation. And I, I, I give thanks to that, for God, to God for that. And, and I believe that can be the experience of so many of us. No matter what we are experiencing right now, I invite you. I invite you to a life with God. And you are invited to the Psalms when you don't know how to pray. Because the Psalms address every aspect of human experience, from the most terrifying moment like my great-great-great-grandmother experienced, to an election that is confusing and chaotic and uncertain, to the civil war in Ethiopia, to the, to the floods and the hurricane in, in, uh, in Central America, to the co-worker who you're just having a hard time getting along with, whether it's trivial or very serious, you can express this to God. Don't just paper over it. Keep a short account with the Lord. Express your heart to the Lord. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. May God bless you, and may you experience the deep abiding presence and comfort of God.